Thank you, Chancellor Gold. Uh, thank you, the media, the leadership of the university, and my fellow colleagues and researchers here. But before I start on the science, I, I'd like to kind of turn around and, and say that what we've done is a collaborative, cooperative effort. It's a clear team, not simply between the University of Nebraska Medical Center and Temple University, but a continuum of scientific strides in medical research throughout the world uh, in combating HIV and HIV disease. When we start, I'd like the cameras to kind of turn around and, and point to the scientists who are really at the cutting edge, who spend their days in and out of the laboratory uh, dedicated almost tirelessly and selflessly to do the biomedical work, uh, sometimes 24-7, and even beyond expanding the day beyond 24 hours uh, in their dedication to find lasting answers, treatments, and inevitably cures for these terrible afflictions, which are notably today are HIV and HIV disease. For Santa Dash, who's my partner, we equivalent, I, I would be the coach, and for Santa, the quarterback of, of this team in collaboration and cooperation with Temple University and Dr. Emil Kalili and his team. So what are we celebrating today? We're celebrating the idea that HIV has the potential now to be eliminated. For over 38 years, we studied the disease, isolated the virus, developed a blood tests, which I'll show you in a minute, came with treatment therapies that change the way we handle patients and in the, in the notion that it's no longer a disease of affliction that ends in certain death, but a disease that can have a normal lifespan, a normal lifestyle, and a normal ability to fulfill goals and life pursuits and function. We never thought even with the vaccines and the trials for so many years that HIV could be eliminated. But today, things have changed. Developed a, a notion, an idea, that we combine technologies developed here in Nebraska and others at Temple in Philadelphia that we can merge together that can bring a lasting cure, elimination of the virus in an infected person. So for the next five or so minutes, I'm going to take you through a short description of exactly what we've done and what we've accomplished, and then leave it then to uh, Dr. Dixon to talk about the commercialization and the development of these technologies, not some foreign land, but right here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, where these drugs can be made, developed, and used for human use and to change the disease course. If you look at this chart, I'm going to pull up the microphone as we go. A lot has happened in the last 36, 30, open to 38 years since the first clinical case of HIV was recognized. And I, I must admit that those early cases were patients of mine. I was a young intern in New York City in 1981 and 82, where we actually saw the first cases of a disease that we really didn't understand. It was devastating, it was acute, and it affected multiple organs and elicited certain death within a short period of time. But within a few years, scientific breakthroughs changed all that. We developed the diagnostic test, we developed a disease monitoring system and ultimately, within 10 years and longer, we developed antiretroviral therapy that changed the course of HIV and AIDS into a manageable clinical uh, process. Ultimately, many experiments were done, many scientific findings were made, and we learned a lot about the molecular structure, the biochemistry, the virology, and the immunology of this disease but we still didn't have a grasp, a grasp to contain and to affect it. We had patients that were not adherent, 
We had other conditions that were associated with this that caused itself devastation. And up until the last few years, the notion that we can get into the HIV virus, the DNA itself, and excise it from the human genome was fantasical, was an idea that we thought we could never attain until today. So what have we done? Well, we've combined technologies, technologies developed where we can take existing drugs and make it into a nanocrystal formulation. We can change how the drug is produced. And when we inject the drug, rather than living for a day and having it used sequentially as a daily inoculum or daily oral therapy, we figured out a way to deliver a single dose of the medicine and have it active for months and potentially for up to a year. Stable levels in tissues that harbor the virus, that continue to have the virus grow and replicate, and we can dampen it down, we can control it, we can restrict it for prolonged periods of time by changing the chemical configurations of how the drug is administered. And this was done right here, right here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. But we're missing a part, and the part is that even we can contain it, we can prevent new infections, we can do nothing about the virus that was already in the human genome. It was latent, it was silent, and there was no drugs, there was no immunological responses. There was no way that we could get at this silent menace, this silent virus in, embedded into the human genome. Until our friends at the Temple University came up with an idea to modulate the CRISPR-Cas system how does that work? But the idea here is we can generate genetic material that can find the virus in a latent state, bind to that virus, and then use scissors, cutting enzymes, to cut the virus out and eliminate it completely. That will eliminate the virus coming back or the rebound that we see commonly with our patients. But there was a significant problem with this CRISPR technology. That problem was, how do we go after every single HIV in a human? There were trillions of viral particles lay inside the human genome. How could we possibly find it? And could we develop a means to eliminate each and every copy of the viral genome or the viral nucleic acid? What we found, when we merged resources and began to collaborate together, that the laser art technology developed here in Nebraska was able to reduce the amount of virus significantly, so significantly, in fact, that the CRISPR technology was now able to go after and excise and eliminate all the residual virus present in this humanized mouse system that we had developed and tested here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So the notion now of taking pills every day for the rest of one's life is now we were in a realistic possibility that this could be eliminated potentially by two separate injections. The injections of a long-acting combination anti-HIV therapy given as a single dose and then combined when we suppress the virus to a level that there are few copies that remain residual in a human. We can then inject the CRISPR technology to excise the HIV DNA. Now, if I said this even a year ago, you say, maybe I need to be admitted to some fantasiful hospital for psychiatric support. We have facilities for that, Howie. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe the, the chancellor would like to see that uh, sooner rather than later. I don't know. He's laughing. But the notion of truth is that experimentally this can be achieved. And not only can be achieved, 
but we built with the support and the incredible backing of the administration at the University of Nebraska, our medical center, the chancellor and the vice chancellors, we built a facility called a GMP. It's a good manufacturing facility and what it enables us is not to go out to some country or foreign land or even uh, other institutions or other facilities or companies within the U.S., but to actually make the drugs right here in the facility, uh, right across the street, in fact. That's where the facility exists. It's all state-of-the-art, and it's all done, it's all built, and it's all readily made. But most importantly, where do we go next? What is our next horizon? What is our next quest? Well, we have to develop this technology so we can find all the HIV that exists in a human, much more than we found in a mouse. So we have to translate these inventions from the mouse and upscale it so it's effective in a human. Secondly, the CRISPR technology does a lot of things. As we all know, in the last several years, it's a genetic transformer, a genetic manipulator. So we have to make sure that it's very specific, that it doesn't affect any of the existing human genes. That can affect all our bodily functions. So the specificity and the adverse events have to be looked at in a very serious and thoughtful manner. And lastly, we have to be able to translate this into a reproducible manner, as you'll hear from Dr. Dixon and the technology that was developed between our institutions and bring them together in a way that we can change the course of not only disease, but to change the course of life. Life in the sense where we can be as an entity, where we can be as a population, we can be as a mankind and a community free of these terrible and dreaded diseases. So I'm going to turn this back to the Chancellor or introduce the technological component of this, essentially how we take these inventions and be able to move it both scientifically and administratively to the patient bedside. Well, thank you, Dr. Gendelman, and again, from all of us here at the Med Center and the University, our most uh, sincere congratulations on this amazing breakthrough and this uh, incredible collaboration. We couldn't be more proud of you and your team, and to the research scientists who are gathered here in the room, and to those of you that are away, please hear us loud and clear of how proud and grateful we are of you for this work and for all of the work that you do. However, as uh, I am uh, known to say all the time, that the research is not done when the paper is published or when the grant is funded or when the platform presentation occurs or even when the press conference is complete. Uh, the research is done when a patient's life has been changed by that research. So in 1991, now in its 28th year, Unimed uh, was founded. Unimed is a corporate structure here at the University of Nebraska uh, Medical Center in the University of Nebraska at Omaha, whose job it is to identify new discoveries, turn those inventions into entities that are uh, protected uh, for their intellectual property, think patents, copyrights, and that sort of thing, and then begin to license those inventions uh, to startup companies, to existing companies, uh, produce further research funding, uh, etc. So in an average year, uh, we identify more than 100 new inventions from different scientists uh, here at the Med Center alone, uh, issue 20 to 25 uh, new license agreements, new corporate startups, and just a lot of research development that is part of this bench to bedside movement that is part of changing the lives of people as a direct result of the research that's being done here. So the leader of that entire enterprise is uh, Dr. Michael Dixon, and I invite you to share a few words uh, with our gathered guests today. Mike. Th thank you, Chancellor Gold, and, and thank you, Dr. Gendelman. That was a, a fantastic description of, of what really is boiling down to um, a significant amount of research. So the developments we're here to talk about today weren't created yesterday or, or a week ago. This is, uh, as you can see, the team has been working on this for years. And, 
And these inventions, these discoveries don't just occur at a single point, they, they occur over time. And so we've been working with Dr. Gendelman and his team to, to make sure that we identify these inventions and help make sure that we, we identify partners that can help us develop the inventions. Um, as you know, uh, the NIH is, is one of our bigger supporters and they fund the early stage research. But when we need to translate these, these results and, and move them into the clinic, typically that funding falls down. And we need to look to industrial partners to help make sure we can support that research and get the, uh, the preclinical work done that's needed to get it into the clinic. And, and that's the stage we're at now. Dr. Gendelman's work on log-acting antiretrovirals has significant promise um, on its own. The technology, as, as you can see in the chart, you're going from 700 pills a year to um, potentially a single shot per year. And that has significant potential uh, for, for all patients. Um, research com or, uh, compliance with uh, taking your regimen of pills, especially when we start to look in third world nations like Africa where the disease is, is very prevalent, the compliance with those pill regimens is difficult. Moving to a single shot or moving to a combinatorial, uh, report, as we're reporting here, and the potential to uh, eliminate the virus has significant potential. But this is where we need to identify those partnerships and identify commercial entities that we can work with to help utilize our GMP facility, produce the drugs, and get the package together that's necessary to do the testing so that we can move this into the clinic. Research discoveries often from, from discovery to getting into the clinic takes several years. We have to make sure that they're safe, that they're effective, and that they don't have the side effects. Because when we move into patients, we want to make sure that that, that first patient tested is um, experiencing something that's going to be safe for them, and that we can get good results that come out of that. Once it moves into the clinic, there's still um, a significant amount of time as it moves through the clinic. So looking at the chart as you identify the the antiretrovirals that, that, were, uh, that made such a big difference back when they were first introduced and allowed these patients to live for a, a long period of time. Those discoveries happened five to ten years prior to being brought you know, into the clinic and then approved for use. So while we're, we're planting a flag and making a, this is a huge discovery and a milestone, there's still a lot of work to be done and that's, that's where we're, we're not letting off the gas. We're going to continue to press forward. We've had great conversations with many companies and we're looking forward to finding the right partner that will bring this technology to the clinic and make it available for patients. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dixon. So let me, before we open this to the questions from the audience, uh, let me be sure that I understand what I learned today. That in this publication by one of the premier nature journals, a report from a collaborative research project with the University of Nebraska Medical Center and Temple University reported in a mouse model uh, obliteration, elimination of the HIV virus as a result of the technology that's been developed both here uh, and at Temple. And that we here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center through a highly functioning and well-equipped GMP, good manufacturing practices facility, are going to be moving ahead with developing similar or identical compounds uh, that will be going continued testing. And then Dr. Dixon reminds us that this is a journey, it doesn't happen overnight, but that this is a significant milestone and it takes us one step forward to complete cure of this devastating disease. So with that, I would like to uh, open this to uh, questions uh, from our audience to our panelists. I've exhausted my knowledge on the subject, so I leave it to Dr. Gendelman and to Dr. Dixon. Yes, young lady. So this translation from mouse to human can still take up to years of research. Yes. Uh, th this animal helps us significantly, though. Uh, this is not a typical mouse. This is what's called a humanized mouse. So the way the animal is made is uh, after a baby is born and the placenta is uh, about to be thrown uh, or discarded, uh, we harvest the cord blood, which have uh, tremendous regenerative potential, they're called uh, stem cells, or stem cell equivalents. So we purify those, 
uh, and they're developed here by Dr. Kolektova and Garantla standing in the audience. So we have a very multidisciplinary group, and we're able to inject them into an animal, into a mouse, and humanize the mouse, so their immune system becomes human. So a significant step forward is our ability to replicate what occurs in a human, in a mouse, using human cells and a human immune system. These products that we're working and developing uh, are being moved uh, as we speak uh, from mice to, uh, to primates. And we're beginning to look at the issues of dosing, of administration, of frequency, of toxicity, and trying to put the pieces together that we can get from additional large animal studies, the information lacking from the mouse. And we hope, again, it depends on how well the experiments go and uh, what are the limitations and pitfalls, that these can be done in a few years, uh, not in decades, that we can move this, uh, this science forward relatively quickly. At this point, again, thanks to the incredible support from the University of Nebraska and enabling us to actually make the drugs right here in Omaha, Nebraska. You know, Howard, you might want to just point out to the audience why this mouse model is so important in terms of the ability to infect uh, other species with HIV, why it's so specific. Yeah, well, I, I, I think for a long time uh, in this chart, we weren't able to study HIV well because the only uh, reflective model was in monkeys and that was not broadly available. So our group and others, as we were part of the early development of these models, came up with the idea that we can repopulate a mouse with a human immune system. Why? Because HIV only infects humans. So we could never use mice as a viable model system for human testing. So that humanization allowed us to study the replication potential, the immunological responses, the therapeutic development. It opened up a huge opportunity for research. And again, this was a first amongst others of these models, and many of these, not only all of them, but some of them were actually developed right here in Nebraska. So a critically uh, important one. What is the success rate between the human models going into, the, with other research that we've done, uh, from the human models into humans? Is there uh, generally a high level of success, or is it kind of risky that this may not really turn into anything when it comes to humans? Okay. Uh, again, an excellent question, and we uh, discussed that offline with uh, several reporters this morning. It's clearly the biggest question that that, or the most significant one that people ask. Uh, we wrote a paper on this, uh, a, what we call a Hallmark paper, which is the uh, center for the field. And the paper was, how good are we in predicting results in mice, ultimately to success in humans? And that appeared as a premier lead article in Nature magazine, the same group of, of Nature journals that we're reporting today. And we found that more than half of them didn't proceed successfully in humans. So we did all these experiments in mice, and many of them didn't succeed, as you said. So the question we asked at this conference uh, several years ago is why? Can we improve the ability of our mouse testing to predict human success? And we found three ways to do that which are all implemented in the studies we're presenting in the Nature article, the Nature Communications article, and at this conference. Number one is using a humanized system, because we don't have to worry about the vagaries of how these therapies may appear to work in a murine or a mouse background. It's different. A mouse is not human. The genetics, the release, the metabolism, everything is different. But if we humanize the mouse, that's one big obstacle that we can overcome. The second is we're all scientists and we're all excited about the results. And we all want the results to come out positive. 
So for these studies and our interactions with Temple, we did what's called blinded investigations. So all the samples we sent to Temple, Temple didn't know whether this was uh, an artifact, meaning no drug was used, whether one drug or two drugs or three drugs were used, and how the samples were collected. This was done in a blinded manner, and that's very important. So the excitement or the predictive value of the investigators who want positive results are totally abrogated, gone. And the third is ensuring that enough experiments are done. And we can't run with a single experiment and say, oh, we got it, we found a cure, or we know what we're doing. These experiments were done painstakingly over periods of many years, reproduced over large numbers of animals at different times, different doses, and even different investigators who were doing these works to ensure reproducibility and rigor, rigor as defined as being rigorous in our approach and what and how we, we actually execute these experiments. So we believe that we're as close as we can be for predicting what would occur in a mouse to a human. Now what is that? Is it 34%, uh, 42, 52? I, I don't know yet. But everything that can be done to ensure the rigor of experimental approach, we've done uh, here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. When will human testing begin? The first human testing will be done uh, through Temple University uh, in 2020. That will be uh, using conventional antiretroviral therapy, and that is simply just to look at potential toxicities and use a very small number of humans. Uh, we're going to try in parallel, because we have our own technologies to, uh, to do a better job with our laser art and our CRISPR technologies, and those, te those works will be moved uh, to uh, primates or other large animals within the next year. Uh, the other thing that we're doing that wasn't asked, but I'm going to ask it myself, is how can we improve a third of our success rate to 100%. So even with all the best of circumstances, we're still about a third successful. So we're working on newer technologies, not only to go after the HIV directly through CRISPR, but to use CRISPR in a way to modulate the human cells so they're less susceptible, and, and we set up the environment in the cell to eliminate HIV more actively with greater speed and agility. Do you know of any possible unintended consequences from the CRISPR, you know, any, or is that kind of have to wait to use that human testing? Wow, you guys are asking all the right questions. <laughs> I guess we all know about, raise your hands of how many people know about CRISPR, right? I mean, like everybody, it's like the hottest uh, technology away, and people are thinking about it as not only a cure for HIV, but much beyond the, of many human afflictions. The biggest problem with CRISPR technology is the worry of what we call off-target toxicities. So though it it's clearly has the ability to manipulate the human genome, does other genes or are all other genes affected by this CRISPR technology? And a lot of things that we do, we breathe, we think, we walk, we are agile, right? We, we have relationships, both on emotional and practical levels. Can any of these be affected by the manipulation of the human genome? This is a new and uncharted territory. So what, we, what nature made us do, what nature made us do, which took us over a year before we were able to publish this paper, is they wanted to get into the mouse, into all the human cells in the mouse, and they said, Dr. Gendelman, this is great and wonderful, but it may not have any human applicability if you're manipulating other genes. So they made us sequence the entire human genome in these mice, in these humanized mice. And that took us uh, way over a year. It was a tremendous time and expense, but we can say with some certainty now that the technology, the CRISPR technology that we used is quite specific and sensitive. There was no other genetic manipulations that were seen after a complete and exhaustive analysis of the entire human genome uh, in these mice, and that is listed 
in the publication. So you didn't see any, you know, harmful side effects with the CRISPR? It, with the CRISPR that we used, I'm not saying with any CRISPR, <laughs> yeah, so with the CRISPR that we used in this uh, study, there was no off-target, what we call, any uncertain toxicities that could be harmful to man or woman uh, who's used with this uh, scientific approach. I know we have a long way to go. We've got a lot more study to do, but you know, people being patient. When do you think, will be years or will be decades before this is available to the public, where people can use it and get help? Okay. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I wish I did. It would. Uh, I, I remember. I, I can give you a little story. A little story, and the story was uh, my first day at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And uh, my friends, because I came from very, I guess, I wouldn't say larger, because this is a really big institution now, but uh, well-known, more well-known institutions. I trained at Hopkins. I trained at Einstein in New York. Uh, I trained at the National Institutes of Health, and I was a military officer at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research when it was at its heyday in immunology. And my boss came to me and he said, if you go to Nebraska, uh, you're going to have to learn that the world isn't round, that the world is flat, and you're going to fall off the side of it, because you're going to take 20, 30, 40 years to do anything meaningful. It's just not going to happen in Nebraska. You should stay at, at Hopkins or Columbia or the NIH. And I said, that's not going to happen. And I said, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to help build this institution. And there's such a great, incredible opportunity to make things that don't exist here in Omaha, Nebraska. And I would say within 20 years, look outside the window. Look outside what's happened. You wouldn't recognize this institution of what it was. And for me to talk today and say, we're the first in the world, the first in the world, to actually have been able to successfully eliminate HIV from an infected animal right in this room. Could that happen? Was it predicted in 5, 10, 15, 20 years? No. So I don't know the answer, but I will say that there's an incredible amount of energy in this room among our scientists. There's an incredible amount of fortitude. There's a tremendous amount of dedication and willingness to go through frontiers that we thought were impossible and make them possible. So the answer to the question is, if I look out the window, I can see things that don't exist. And I think that is what we are as scientists. And to pull this together, not in 10, 14, 22 years, but to do it within a few years, I think it's possible. Can I say for sure? No. But I can tell you that we'll give it 1,000% effort to make this dream a reality. Dr. Gentleman, or Dr. Dixon, either one of you, to po pony off of that, when, when Dr. Salk invented the vaccine for polio, was in March of, he announced in March of 53, yeah. and it basically went to clinic by 55. So I'm not saying that since the timetable, but has, has anything changed in the medical community between the 50s and now yeah. to accelerate, I, I you know? Go, please. Uh, yeah, so, so if, you, if you look back, the FDA doesn't remove regulations, they add regulations every time something happens. So if you think of, if you think of impacts that patients have had, they want to protect us, and they want to make sure we get good, safe drugs. And so every time they've added, it means we have more to do. So we have a lot more toxicity, a lot more hormone, and we have more tools to do these now. So what that means is when we get into the clinic with drugs, typically they've been tested more. They're, they're typically safer than they were in the past. And so if you look at the way uh, drug development went in the, the 50s and 60s, or quite frankly, even a decade or two decades ago, it was quicker. And that's a challenge that we have right now in the business. Is, is to get early stage discoveries through that preclinical testing and so it can they move into the clinic. Even once it's in the clinic, if you look at the testing that occurs, it still takes um, five to seven years typically to get phase one, phase two, phase three. And so we want to get this preclinical work done as quickly as, can, as we can. And as Dr. Gendelman said, we are, we are doing everything we can to get the tests done that, that the FDA is going to want. And we're trying to partner with a company so that, that we, we can have them have what's called an investigational new drug application. 
So by finding partners that can support that, that allows us to move to the clinic quicker. And that's why we're aggressively pursuing the protection and commercialization of this technology. So maybe I can just briefly add, uh, just to say that uh, UNMC has extensive experience in the commercialization of new drugs. We have excellent resources to do so. And rest assured, we're going to do everything that we can scientifically, ethically, and legally to move this as quickly as possible. The demand for this type of treatment around the world is unprecedented and will continue to grow and there's every reason to believe that uh, we can and will deliver on that promise. Sorry, yes young lady. So you're saying, wow, young lady. <laughs> um, so you're saying that this work will Yes, and, and quite frankly, both drugs are independently going to need their own IND because these are both preclinical drugs. And so the best thing we can do is advance the laser art as quickly and effectively as possible so that as they get approved, they can be used combinatorially or approved to be used combinatorially. Uh, you know, the, the benefits of laser art on its own are significant. The, the findings that, that Dr. Gendelman's team has shown of, of um, the advantages of long-acting antiretrovirals are a fantastic step forward. The, the next step is showing that when they're used in, in combination with this, this new CRISPR-Cas9 that, that we can get to eradication, which was thought to be impossible um, just a year or so, or maybe a few weeks ago before this paper. Um, and so the, these, are, these are new discoveries which are um, very exciting but, but still need to be you know, shown in multiple systems as, as discussed so that they can be safe and effective when they do move into the clinic. Yes. I have two back-to-back -back questions. So the first one, um, with laser art and CRISPR, did you say that those were both created here in Nebraska? No, so the, the CRISPR technology, the CRISPR-Cas9 here is coming out of Temple. And the laser art technology is um, Dr. Gendelman's here at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Gotcha. Um, and then I want to bring up, you know, like Northwestern and Lyrica. Like, are you seeing that this might have kind of a similar, you know, outcome that they have? I think that's the dream. Um, you know, the, the impact that Lyrica had on Northwestern is substantial, and, and not just from the patients that it, it helps. So the, the reports that came back it were so significant that the patients that got Lyrica, but, but the financial impact, and that's one of the things that we do try to, to make sure is that when a drug is commercialized, that there's an impact in the institution and that we can continue to grow the research and development programs and fund more of the, the technologies that are discovered and need to be developed into products. And that's one of the great things Northwestern has done, is taken some of the revenue from Lyrica and put it into translational programs. And so they're seeing the next generation of drugs and devices come out of the university. And that's, that's exactly where we want to be in, in uh, say, 10 years. So do you guys think you guys are on that level yet? Or kind of yeah, this is an early discovery, but you know that's our, that's our that's our goal. That's where we want to be. Every technology that, that's developed here, we want to see developed into a product. We want to see people helped. We want to see healthcare get better. And we also want to see the institution continue to grow its research mission, identify new uh, drugs and devices, and, and have an impact. Anything else? Yes. Just on a more personal note, millions of people are affected by HIV here in the States, around the world. How do you think people that are affected by this disease will feel hearing this news? <laughs> Your word. I, I, I would say uh, pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think there will be anything but that. I, I, we did talk, I, this particular story, as many of you know, has uh, reached international uh, levels. So we actually got a call this morning from Estonia um, and they want to do a, a, uh, a press briefing and discussion through Skype and they asked, they asked me the same question. They said so many people in Estonia are affected and probably and they know uh, all over the world. I, I, I don't think there's any difference. People are people. And, and we're providing encouragement, support. I mean, that's kind of one of, you know, one of our principal missions 
is not only to provide state-of-the-art health care uh, and prevention of disease, but to bring hope and, and to change the way we think about our disease, our society, and what the medical center means in kind of a bigger sense. We're not simply providing health care. We're at the cutting edge of research and discovery. We're at the cutting edge of education and development. And we're at the cutting edge to be part of our community. And, and that community is not in Omaha, Nebraska. That community is a global community where we can really change the world. And not simply for combating disease, but providing hope, encouragement, and direction in a, in a big way uh, right here in, in Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you very much. We're very grateful for all of you being here. And I'm sure that Dr. Gandelman and Dr. Dixon and I will be around at least for a few minutes to answer any questions that you might have. And uh, thanks for being a uh, part of yet another day that UNMC makes history. Thank you.